Christian Parent Crazy World with Catherine Seegers is brought to you by Life Audio and is part of our Faith Toolkit series. For more inspirational faith-affirming podcasts, visit lifeaudio.com. Welcome to Christian Parent Crazy World, the podcast that tackles tough topics to help you raise godly kids in an ungodly world. I'm your host, Katherine Seegers, and today's episode tackles this question. What is the key for our kids to have an authentic faith? So at the end of the last episode, I may have said that in this episode, we were going to discuss how to help our kids contend for their faith. And then I may have looked at all of that information and realized it was really a lot of information. It was best to break that up into two episodes. So this episode, I'm talking about what the key is for our kids to have an authentic faith. Then I promise you, the very next episode, I'm actually going to break it down for you and give you seven key steps that you can take to help your kids contend or wrestle for their faith. Now, in episode one, we discuss the reality that we see in the church today. An astronomical number of kids, a majority, leave the faith after graduating from high school. To recap uh, some of the things I talked about, just very briefly, a New Life Way research survey that came out in January of 2019 shows that two-thirds of Two-thirds of young people stop attending church between the ages of 18 and 22. And most studies indicate between 45 and 48% of youth leave the church after their freshman year in college and never return. It's sobering. These statistics are sobering. Now, in that episode, I also talked about why our youth are leaving the church and exactly what they believe that makes it so easy for them to bail on their faith. So if you didn't catch that episode, you should check it out. Also, in that debut podcast, I mentioned a book by Tom Bissett that gives four reasons why our Christian youth are leaving the faith. And that book is called Why Christian Kids Leave Their Faith. It's very appropriately titled. So in that book, he gives these four reasons, and I want to hone in on that fourth reason he offers. That is, they left the faith because they never personally owned it. Their faith wasn't deep. It wasn't abiding. It wasn't authentic. And today, I want to share with you the story of a friend of mine who brought this truth, this reality home for me in such an instructional way. I want to tell you Jenny's story because there are so many powerful lessons we can take away from her experience. Then I want to look at a story from scripture that will help us learn how to foster an authentic faith, both in our own lives and in our kids. So I have this friend named Jenny. She's a a fellow homeschooling mom. We happen to homeschool, and she does too. She also has five kids. We don't all have five kids, I promise. But her oldest son is named Mark, and Mark graduated from high school, and after two years of college, he left the faith. He is now agnostic. He he doesn't know if there is a God. He's questioning everything about Christianity. He, He doesn't really believe it anymore. And so I'm like, Jenny, what went wrong? And, you know, she's thought about this a lot. She explains to me, she says, you know, when my kids were younger, we kind of presented the faith to them as a package. Here's what we believe. Here is what you should believe. It was it was kind of like this gift, right? And later in their homeschool curriculum, they switched to a different one, which is what we do now. It's called, it's a classical Christian education. And our motto is, literally, one of the things we always say is that we don't teach our kids what to think. We teach them how to think, how to reason through an issue, how to discern what is true and what is false. Unfortunately, they weren't doing that right from the beginning with Mark. They got into that far too late. And she was saying, you know, and I was just totally agreeing as Christian parents, we have got to get away from that kind of thinking of of, of teaching our kids what to think. That is indoctrination. 
That is what the world does. We are not a cult. We are not like the world. We are not telling our kids what to think. We're not indoctrinating them. We are teaching them how to think. That is That needs to be the way we're operating and the way we're thinking. Our faith is not illogical. God does not require us to chuck our intellect at the door of the church. You know, um, I'm sure you've heard of, a, you may have heard of a guy named Lee Strobel. He wrote a number of books. I think the first one was The Case for Christ. He he came to faith through investigation. He was an investigative journalist, and he set out to disprove the Bible. And through logic, through reasoning, through the claims of Scripture, he came to realize that it was true. And we can we can set our kids on that same kind of journey with that same kind of expectation. So I kept talking with Jenny, and she shared with me this story from scripture that I think really encapsulates what we need to do with our kids. It was it was the story of Jacob and Esau. You probably know this. It starts in Genesis chapter 25. It goes on for like 15 chapters or so. It's the story of these two brothers. They're twins in the womb. And Esau is born first, so he gets the birthright. He gets all the spoils, the, the riches, the blessing from the father. And one day, Esau is out and he's working hard and he comes in, he's really hungry. And his brother Jacob has made this bowl of stew that apparently smelled amazing and Esau is starving and Jacob offers him the stew. He says, sure, you know, I'll give you some if you'll give me your birthright, your inheritance. And Esau says, look, I am about to die. What good is the birthright to me? That's literally what he says to him. What use is this birthright in the face of such an an overpowering appetite and need? This precious treasure, it just wasn't valuable to Esau. Of course it wasn't valuable to him. He never had to fight for it. Jacob, on the other hand, wanted it more than anything. And he manages to, to connive and scheme to get it from his brother who didn't value it. But in order to To actually receive the full blessing, he had to trick his father. He had to dress up like Esau in order to get the blessing and pretend that he was his brother. And after that happens, um, Esau threatens to kill him and he goes away for several decades. Now, if you look at this, on paper, Esau is the better son. He's the archer, the huntsman. He's a man's man. He's industrious and hardworking. Jacob is just a liar and a cheat. He's a thief. But then we see in chapter 32, after being away for several decades, Jacob is returning to his homeland, the land of his father. And he's, he's afraid for his life that his brother might follow through on this threat to kill him. And so on the way back, he's by himself as his family's a little ways away. And he lays down to sleep and God comes to him in the night and Jacob wrestles with God until daybreak. He wrestles with God all night long. And the man, who who is God, finally says to Jacob, let me go, for it is daybreak. It's like, we've been doing this all night. Jacob says, no, no, I will not let you go unless you bless me. That is the moment Jacob's name is changed. God says to him, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. The name Israel literally means the one who struggles with God and overcomes. And that, that my friend, that is what we want our kids to have is that encounter with God where they wrestle with him and they determine that they are not going to leave despite disappointment and discouragement. They are not going to leave despite confusion, despite all of the secular ideology that, that may come, that they are not going to leave. And so that is what we are trying to train our kids to do. We want our kids to have a personal faith, not like Esau's where something better comes along, some better ideology, some questions they cannot answer, and they just chuck the whole thing because it doesn't make sense anymore. No, we want to train our kids to wrestle. That is the key because that is the point 
Jacob's faith became real. It became authentic. It became genuine. It was no longer his father's faith. It was no longer his brother's birthright. This faith became his own. That is what we want. We want our kids to have a personal faith. We don't want them to have a faith that we just packaged up and gave them. That kind of faith is is pretty easy to walk away from when things get inconvenient or confusing or difficult or downright contentious. That kind of faith is pretty easy to leave when our kids strike out on their own and everybody they know is walking down a pretty wide path and their faith tells them to take the narrow road. Our kids are going to need something genuine and authentic, a faith with some miles on it if it is going to stand strong into adulthood. They need a faith that is their own, that is authentic. And that requires some wrestling. You know, I I love that the name Israel means one who wrestles with God and overcomes. Our kids will need to wrestle with scripture and and with disappointment and and heartache and doubt and offense and an imperfect church and a world that doesn't agree with what they believe. Actually, they're going to have to to wrestle with a world that condemns what they believe. And you know what else I love? I love that the name Israel also means one who wrestles with men and overcomes. Our kids are going to have to, to wrestle with the ideas of men and women. They're going to have to wrestle with humanism and materialism and secularism and agnosticism and atheism and and <laughs> like a whole slew of other isms. There is no end to the isms they will need to wrestle with and overcome in order to stand strong in their faith. So how do we teach our kids to wrestle for their faith? That is the topic of our next podcast. I'm going to give you seven steps that you can use to help your kids learn how to wrestle for an authentic faith. I hope you will join me for that in every future episode where we take aim at some aspect of our culture that threatens to derail our parenting and steal our kids' faith. I want to thank you for joining me today. Look, I know there are a lot of things you could be listening to right now, and I really appreciate that you spent this time with me. If you enjoyed this episode of Christian Parent Crazy World, would you consider telling a friend and, and sharing it on social media? And uh, I don't know, maybe maybe just say that it was the best podcast you've ever heard in your entire life. Just just a thought. And be sure to check out my website, which is katherinesegers.com. That's Catherine with a C. I have lots of articles and resources there that will help you on your parenting journey. And if you subscribe, I will be sure to send you some really cool free stuff and notify you of future podcasts, articles, and blogs. I want to end this and every episode with a word of encouragement. God gave you your kids, your specific kids for a reason. That's because you hold the key to unlocking who God created them to be. We'll see you next time. Christian Parent Crazy World is a production of Life Audio and the Salem Web Network. To hear more from Katherine Seegers, visit her site, katherineseegers.com. If you enjoyed this episode, would you take a minute and leave us a rating and review in your podcast app? It really does help us connect to more listeners like you. A special thanks to Kelly Gibbons, Stephen Sanders, and Stephen McGarvey for their production and editing on this episode. You can find more podcasts like this over at lifeaudio.com.